So today, Dave, you brought us to Bathpool Park, and this is where one of the most horrific murders Kidsgrove has ever seen took place. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, it was January 1975. Um, a young lady by the name of Leslie Whittle um, was kidnapped from a home in Highley, which is in Shropshire. And that at the early hours of the 14th, she was actually brought here to Bathpool um, by a kidnapper. And what we're going to do today is have a look at some of the shafts within the park. To give you a bit of background on Leslie, Leslie was known as a heiress. Um, a father, George, who owned a coach company, a very shrewd businessman, 70 coaches, millionaire. Um, he actually passed away in 1972. And he left a lot of that money within that will to both Leslie and a brother, Ronald, um, which was reported in the paper a number of times, and I'll talk on that a little bit later as well, yeah. how that all came about. So, yeah, that, that's Leslie Whittle. That's Leslie Whittle. So, so just, just before we do actually leave this uh, particular area, can you just tell me a little bit about Donald Nielsen and yeah. how he actually knew the Whittle family? Okay, Nielsen was born in 1936. Um, he was uh, from Bradford. He um, was ex-military. He was a petty thief, um, small-time burglar. But he never got caught. Uh, over 400 burglaries he committed up to 1972, at which point he needed to, in his words, step up a gear. Right. He was looking for something that would actually make him comfortable for life. He wasn't after £500 a year, he was after he a was big He was after one. big money. Yeah, and what happened in 1969, there was a woman by the name of Muriel Mackay, who was actually kidnapped. She worked uh, a, a her husband was deputy editor for Rupert Murdoch, um, and she was kidnapped. And he read, it was, there was a book regarding this kidnapping. It was read by um, Nielsen. And he looked at this and thought, you know, this is something I could do. That kidnapping was an absolute catalogue of errors, that kidnapping was. They never found a body. In fact, only this week, January, well, January 31st, um, a farmer has given permission to search his land um, down south um, to find the remains of this Muriel's body. So I was doing this this week and that news coming out. So we actually read that around about 1970, 71, uh, when he found out about that. So yeah, I'll tell you a little bit more when we go down further, down to the other areas. The other areas. So shall we take a walk down now to shaft one? Where... Yeah, I think if we start at shaft one that's easy. So we're here at shaft one. Can you tell me the significance of this shaft? And can you tell me a little bit more about Nielsen? Okay, I'll start with Nielsen first. Mention him at the top, being born in 1936, etc. Um, Nielsen's um, mother, who he adored, died when he was only 10. His father was a strict disciplinarian. Um, he got a sister. And Nielsen was actually, at the age of 10, trans transitioned in to take the place of his mother. He would do all the household cleaning, the cooking. Um, he, he always felt that the world owed him. He got no friends outside of, well, within school when he was there. Um, he started to be a petty thief when he was 12, 13. He got in trouble with the police at that age um, and later became a, a prol prolific burglar, to be honest. He spent time in the military, two years. He was very, very much, he loved the military. Uh, he met Irene, his wife, around about 19, early 1950s. Um, they married a couple of years later and she talked to him about coming out of the army, which many people say that that was 
his downfall, really. You've got a daughter, Catherine, who is very, very similar age to um, Leslie, only a couple of years between them. Um, he was a failure in everything he did, except the burglaries, where he, you know, it was accepted. He was never caught 400 burglaries. But he had jobs as a joiner, he was a painter and decorator, taxi driver, window cleaner, you name it, he did it. And he failed at, at everything he tried to get involved with. everything with. he did, he, he, he was just a total failure and yeah, couldn't do he, anything. Yeah, he was just, he, he was just this guy who thought society owed him something, mm. yeah. And we'll see later on how some of that changed with the publicity he was getting. Yeah. Um, and how, how it actually built up his arrogance to um, to the world, really, um, and himself. So this, we're looking at three. We're looking at three shafts today. This is shaft number one. This was known in the court cases of Gloriol. Shaft two is 50 yards to my right, and a few of the 50 yards just over the bridge there is where Leslie's body was found. Um, there's a, a myth that Nielsen, why did he choose Bathpool? Um, people thought that Nielsen worked on the railway lines behind us in the 60s, the right. tunnels, and the, no he didn't, there's no evidence whatsoever. But what Nielsen did, and again it was this military mind that he'd actually got, he disappeared from his wife and child for, for days on end, and he'd go on what he called, said to the family, I'm going on a manoeuvre. Right. He'd pack his tents up, he'd pack his uh, sleeping bag, his cooking utensils, he'd take a few gut guns, and he'd go and disappear into the wilderness, really, you know, across Lancashire, um, Yorkshire, West Midlands, and here in Staffordshire, and this was one area he actually visited on one of his manoeuvres. So he did a manoeuvre here in Bathpool? Yeah, he, he was coming coming down this way and he came across this hole. But I touched on Muriel um, Mackay and the kidnapping that was botched when we, earlier. He actually thought, he'd planned this um, from 1972 for Leslie Whittle. In 1972 he read in the Daily Express, it was in all the newspapers, that George Whittle had died in 72 and he left his family the equivalent of a couple of million pounds. So he thought this is an easy target. And he thought the, this family, the Whittles, didn't deserve this anyway. Because what tripped that in his mind, he saw a piece in the newspaper that talked about his first wife, Selena. Right. And Selena was actually living on two pound a week. She was destitute, really. Um, and he thought that wasn't right. So that ticked the box to take his revenge yeah. out on the Whittles. And that's what happened. So yeah, we're at number one. When we get up to number two, I'll tell you a little bit more. Um, his real name, before I do, was um, Nappy. When he was at school, his name was Nappy. And you can imagine a name that, like Nappy, the bullying he actually got at he school. He got at school, he went yeah. through hell, probably with it. And he did, and he did. So when Catherine was four years old, he wasn't going to put Catherine through that. So that's when he changed his name to Nielsen. Some say he got the name Nielsen from an ice cream van. Some say they got it from a taxi company. Um, but that's that's history. That's what he did. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Gloriol, number one. Um, quite significant. He saw this. And what this is, is the first part of a complex labyrinth of um, shafts across the area. Um, he saw this and clicked. He planned it all. I now know what I need to do, and that's what he started using. This is quite significant because this case itself is a catalogue of errors, and there's lots of disputes, and I'll talk about a few. But after that, the bundling of the first um, drop, they, around this area, if it had been searched, they would have found dyno tape guns, they would have found uh, cameras. They would have found tape recorders that were all in this shaft. All here. Yeah. There was even one flashlight that was actually, it's this gate here. It was tape two, and that was when the flashlights were yeah. dropped. Yeah, here. So I'll talk about a few more of the areas later, but yeah, that's where we got to here. We're going to go up to number two in a minute. But on that night of the kidnap, uh, it, it was very very much January the 14th it, it was early hours 1 30 a.m. in the morning on January the 14th he went into their house through the integral garage he'd already he'd already um, been on recce to the house he'd been in the house 
He'd been in the house. S several times, yeah. He went up to the stairs. The original intention was to kidnap Dorothy, Mum. He didn't. The first bedroom he went into was Leslie's. But when he got to that bedroom, he changed his mind. He wasn't going to kidnap Dorothy. He, he decided to kidnap Leslie. Leslie was in bed. She, she'd got nothing on at all. He threw a dressing gown at her, told her to put her slippers on, gagged her and put a sawn off shotgun in her face. Took her outside, bundled into his Austin 1300, which he'd stolen previously. And that's when he actually brought her to here. But before he left the house, he actually left a ransom note. But the ransom note wasn't a normal ransom note, it was dymo taped. Which is, again, is very, very important when I've just mentioned they found the, a dime, the gun dymo down tape there, gun yeah. there. Yeah. So it was very, very important. This, this ransom note that he actually left within the house um, was six foot long. It talked about exactly what he wanted them to do, uh, what he wanted Ronald to do. And throughout it says, no police, no tricks, or death. And that was something that was in his head all the way through through this. Um, so yeah, he, he actually bundled her in. He brought her up to here. Um, the previous week, weeks before, on shaft number three, he'd already furnished that with sleeping bags, with food, with snacks, with colouring books. Um, it's a tape recorder in there. There was even half a bottle of brandy. So when he brought Leslie from Highley to here, 65 miles away, he put her into that shaft, everything was there. Once she was in the shaft, a wire noose around her neck, he gagged her, he tied her, her legs, and basically put her in the, in the sleeping bag. So she was stuck there, she couldn't move. She couldn't move. She, she, couldn't, she move. couldn't move. What he did then, he drove another 65, 70 miles up to Bradford. And he was in Bradford that same morning, on the 14th, early, early morning, half seven, eight o'clock. When the neighbours opened the curtains, he was there in his back garden, it was Nielsen. So he's creating a perfect alibi for himself, yeah, he isn't he, really? he planned it all. He yeah. absolutely planned it all. And when you, when you look at the timelines, the timelines are so difficult, you know, to get your head round. So he'd done that. He'd obviously been up all night. He'd, he'd come to here, gone to Bradford. As soon as things were settled there, he was back down here. Mm. And then from here, he went down to Kidderminster because he'd left them a message that the drop was going on that evening, still on the 14th, but the evening, uh, down in Kidderminster, at the Swan Shopping Centre. He instructed um, the brother to go to the Swan, the two, three phone box there, between 6 p.m. and 1 a.m. and to expect a phone call of where to do the drop. Yeah. What actually happened, um, and this was one of the first mistakes, somebody released the news that Leslie had been kidnapped. And at 8 o'clock on BBC Radio, announcement went out that Leslie had been kidnapped eight o'clock in the evening at nine o'clock it appeared on BBC nine o'clock news so all of a sudden they're in a stake out here the police are there all hidden plain clothes waiting for the phones to go and it's all over the press but Nielsen hadn't seen it but the police weren't to know that so the guy who was running the stake out actually aborted that drop that particular drop yeah so he stopped the operation? Stopped the operation. At one o'clock, from 12, between 12 and 1, calls started to come through to those phone boxes from Nielsen. But obviously there was nobody there. There was nobody there. So it was the first bodge up that we actually come across. Mm. But if we go across to number two now, um, I'll take you through the next couple of days, the next 72 hours and what happened. Was, was I right in saying just before we leave here, this should have happened 12 months prior to when it did? Yeah, 1973. Um, in, sorry, in 1973, he planned for it to happen in January the 14th, 1974. So yeah. it was a year earlier he wanted to take place. But in 1973, the government introduced three-day working. Um, petrol was rationed or people were told not to drive. He didn't want to be conspicuous driving up and down the motorways for this, so, um, which he would have done because there's no cars on the road, really. And what actually happened then, he didn't decide to delay it for two weeks, two months or three months. He delayed it for an entire year but that came with a problem because now he got no money coming in got he needed to step up again in his words on the post offices and that's what happened what in happened? 1974 yep. and i'll talk you through some of them when we get to, to the next two. next shaft
So we're here at Shaft 2, Dave, but before we start on Shaft 2, can you tell me about 1974 and these post offices? Yeah, OK, this is where Nielsen, as I alluded to when we were at Shaft number 1, he, he delayed the kidnapping, so he got to find money revenue from somewhere. Um, and he decided to step up a gear, those were his words, and he targeted three post offices. The first one was in Harrogate, and that was in February. The second one was in Accrington in Lancaster, in Lancashire. Um, that was around about July, August time. And the last one was five weeks later after that, which was Langley in the West Midlands. He, he'd stalked the post offices. He'd planned them, again, very, very detailed his planning. Um, he knew exactly who was going to be in those post offices at what time. He first entered the Harrogate one and he, the postmaster and his wife actually disturbed him. Without hesitation, he actually blew two gunshots into the postmaster, which killed him there and then. He escaped with nothing from that post office. The second one he actually went to, the Accrington one, he actually did exactly the same. Late evening, um, broke in, they disturbed him, he shot the postmaster, again killing him, to cold, he's a cold bloody killer, yeah. without hesitation, he, he killed um, this guy. Um, the wife actually was able to give a photo fit description of what she saw, and what she saw was this man all in black. Sometimes some of his raids, he was in army camouflage gear, but in this instant, it was all in black with a black mask. She said he moved very, very quietly, very, very swiftly. And this was reported in the newspaper. The photo fit resembled what people say was, or the press said, was a panther. That's where he got the name, the Black Panther. When he got down to Langley, and he loved that, that the press absolutely public enemy number one the black panther yeah i think he touched on it he he got a real kick from that he, he thought it was fantastic oh yeah he's been a failure all his life all of a sudden he's there he's he's number one as far as he's concerned he's been successful yeah that's how his warped mind actually worked so then he went down to langley um didn't get a lot away with a lot in accrington at all he went down to west midlands langley and Again, he was disturbed by the sub-postmaster, his wife, but also his two kids. And in, in this one, he actually, again, killed him, killed the sub-postmaster. He actually beat um, the wife up, beat her up to a pulp uh, with the butt of the gun. And then he just escaped. He just disappeared. And that's really brought it up to the end of the year he escaped with 816 pound i think from langley um, but then the year had passed and he was ready to do a move on the kidnapping of leslie Whitton. so can you tell me the timelines of this yeah um so we've talked about the tuesday which is the 14th an all day in the evening um on the which with the which ended in the botched um drop down in the swan center down in kidderminster he was going again on the Wednesday, the 15th. This time he'd come back to here. We knew he'd already been to Bradford and back. Came to here and he taped Leslie. And he issued that tape of Leslie to um, Leslie's brother and mother. Um, on the tape, Leslie says something on the lines of, I'm safe, I'm being well looked after, I was wet. I'm now dry, which some people believe she was trying to give him a hint that she was in drains. Got you. You know, yeah. but nobody, nobody picked up on that. Um, I, you know, you can see where they were coming from because she was a very, very intelligent uh, young lady. So he arranged, he was arranging for the drop to be this time outside Dudley Zoo, gate number eight, Dudley Zoo. Um, he went down that early evening, six o'clock, 6.15. Right across the road was a freight company and he needed to use the yard within the freight for part of the drop-off. So he went across to the yard where he was disturbed by a security guy, uh, Gerald Smith. 
Gerald Smith approached him, and as he approached him, he didn't answer. Nielsen didn't answer. So Neil Smith turned his back and went towards the office to phone the police. As he was doing that, he was shot twice in the back. Smith turned round, and um, Nielsen shot him a further four or five times in the front, where, where he collapsed. This, obviously, for obvious reasons, spooked Nielsen. Now, Smith didn't die from his injuries immediately. 14 months later, he did. But he was able to give an, an account of exactly what happened. And again, another photo fit. The Austin 1300 was parked on the car park right next to Dudley Zoo. Right. In that car was guns, was a mattress, was a sleeping bag. It was all the tools he'd already got here at Bath Pool. He used to duplicate everything. He had a spare of everything. But nobody knew about that car. And it wasn't raised as a, as a potential stolen car for eight days. If it had been, it would have maybe changed things again. So the ballistics went off for the shooting. And this is when, at this point, the, the bullets went over to Nottingham. And Nottingham came back and said, we've got a match. These bullets are exactly the same bullets that um, were involved in the Black Panther murders. So... And the sub folks stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so we... This is, let's say, six early evening. Somehow we got back to... Um, back to here. Um, and what he did then, he arranged for another drop. But the drop this time was to be here at Bath Pool. Now this is 10.30, 11 p.m. on that Wednesday evening where he's actually sent a tape through and told them to come to Bath Pool. That he was to bring the 50,000, no police, no tricks or death, to go to the, the phone box outside the post office in Kidsgrove. Yeah. In there behind the board would be a dymo tape message that would say, and actually said, go to Bath Pool car park follow the road round till you get the wall that wall is behind us that's the wall so that's the wall there yeah it was to come there and then there was going to be a signal from here and this is where Nielsen was originally okay but errors first of all they were running an hour and a half late from Bridge North Nielsen, Nielsen was expecting him to be here around about two-ish uh, the latest really um, it wasn't until 3.30, 4 o'clock he got here. When he actually got here, they got to the post, off, the post office, he couldn't find the demo tape. When he eventually found it, he'd lost another 15, 20 minutes. He come to here, he missed that wall, he drove straight past and ended up at the ski centre, which is probably a quarter of a mile that way towards the actual lake itself. Um, Ronald actually got out of the car down there, was flashing his lights, was screaming and shouting, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. But there was nobody. Nobody there. Nielsen had gone. He'd gone. And he'd gone for several reasons. One of the reasons was, around about 2.30 in the morning, a car pulled onto the car park. And what it was, it was a courting couple. But Nielsen was here flashing his light, flashing his torch. The, the car actually flashed back. Then another car appeared. And the second car that appeared was a police panda car that pulled further down. Now, Westman's Mercia Police had contacted Staff Staffordshire Police to let them know it was going down, but not to get involved. Do not risk. In fact, Bob Booth, the Chief Superintendent of West Mercia, told them to all take the night off. But for whatever reason, there was a panda car here. And that, again, was about 2.45. So he did feel that this, this was a trap. He'd been spooked. Yeah. He'd actually been spooked. Now, Staffordshire Police are completely in denial that that, their pan, that panda car was a Staffordshire Police panda car. And they were arguing for months and months and months and no, no love was lost there at all. So, the actual drop was aborted. Um, Neil, when Nielsen um, fled, he actually fled here. The big mistake they made then was that what Booth wanted, he wanted the area searched that next morning. Scotland Yard, however, 
said, no, you're drawing attention to it. If we've got a chance of saving Leslie, we don't want to do a full scale okay. save. Just, just to recap then, on that morning after the bungled um, drop, when, it, when the light came, the police could actually see the park. This is the first time the police had actually seen this park in daylight. Um, Bob Booth, Chief Superintendent of West Mercia Police, he wanted to do a full scale search of the area, the entire park, a couple of miles of park. Scotland Yard advised against it. And this only came out in the court case um, when it came to court. Scotland Yard said basically he could be putting Leslie's, if she's still alive, Leslie's life at risk. Because if he gets wind there's an operation here, he feel that A, he's been betrayed. So they chose to do sort of a light touch um, search with Scotland Yard operatives. And they reported back to Booth a few hours later that they found nothing, which is a net, again another major mistake. So we're talking we're only on the 16th, 17th of January here, a couple two or three days after the initial um, kidnapping. No other surge took place until around about March the 5th. So we're looking at six, seven weeks down the line. And that was a full scale surge. And what was found during that search, I've already said about the flashlight down at number one, and I've already said about the binoculars at number one. Um, there's also the um, recording machine at number one. What was found here at number two was Dymo tape. Dymo tape, exactly the same type of Dymo tape, and on that Dymo tape it said, drop the case in the hole. So that was a sign. Also here was a spanner that opened up all of these um, shafts and at number three where, where Leslie's body was found there was a leather coat and another set of binoculars found so you ask yourself why how did Scotland Yard miss all this evidence that was found six seven weeks later because we know for a fact after that night Nielsen fled he never came back here he wouldn't risk it so all that was there it's at the time at the time yeah so yeah, Booth was absolutely frustrated, annoyed, etc., etc. Could it have changed things? We don't really know because what the criminal psychologist actually said was everything that happened that night, the police car turning up, the, the courting couple with the lights flashing, the fact that um, Ronald um, Whittle was two hours late, he panicked. He, he thought he'd been betrayed and the police were all over it. And his, in that anger... And a number of the detectives agreed with the psychologist. He was here. That was it. He went straight up to shaft number three where Leslie oh, really? was sitting. Yeah. Straight down that shaft. And what they believe is he just pushed her off that, sh off that um, shelf. In rage. In rage. Yeah. And go. He denied it all the way through all, all the um, court case, everything. He eventually admitted to all the sub postmaster murders, but he completely denied ever pushing Leslie. Um, but you know, I tend to agree with the psychologist that that anger, that fuel up pent up anger, and that feel of betrayal led to him pushing, pushing her off her there. Off. Yeah. But if we go across to number three, let's have a look at number three. We'll go to the pathway on number three, and I'll show you uh, where um, the final part of this story actually ended, ended. when. Um, Leslie was found on March the 7th, um, seven weeks, eight weeks after being kidnapped. Let's go have a look then, eh? Okay. So we're now here at the next shaft, and I believe this is where Leslie Whittle's body was actually found, is that correct, Dave? Yeah, this is shaft number three. It's just in the background there. Um, you may be able to see the, the floral tributes because it's the 49th year anniversary um, this week. Um, next year being 50 years, which is 
So it's 50 years. 50, 50 years, years next yeah. year, yeah. 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 This is a shaft. As I said, all the shafts are interconnected. These are the three main shafts we visited today. Um, we won't go up to the actual shaft here in respect. We'll be sensitive and yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, she was found on that on that following morning on the um, on the Friday morning, um, very very early. Um, everybody was absolutely devastated, as you can imagine. Um, it was shocking, shocking for the area as well. So what, what actually happened in the end to Donald Nielsen then, Dave? Did, Nielsen, they, did Nielsen, they catch him or...? Nielsen went undercover, went undercover, he disappeared. He was the phantom, you know, the Black Panther that disappeared off the uh, face of the earth. Um, but by chance, complete fluke, um, in December of 75, he was actually casing out another post office. So he was going to do another robbery, was he? Yeah, in yeah. Mansfield, Woodhouse. Um, and two policemen were patrolling, it was late at night, and they spotted this guy with a bag who was looking a little bit suspicious, and they decided they approached him, good evening, etc. And straight away, Nielsen pulled a sawn off shotgun on them the police. and told them to, to, he jumped in the car and he told them to drive. He absolutely just said, drive, drive, drive. And Sherwood, they wanted to take in Sherwood Forest, but um, they knew exactly if they got to Sherwood Forest, he'd kill them. He'd kill them? He, yeah. He, he'd kill them. At that point, they didn't know it was a, it was a Black Panther. So they had no idea no, who they'd, no. who, who, who so, they'd so got. So they took the opportunity. Um, what Nielsen had got in the driver, he got his sonar shotgun in the ribs of the driver. They saw the opportunity going around a bend he spun the car and the other policeman was able to grab the gun off him well it fired straight through the roof and they crashed the car right ne next to a fish and chip shop right, with right. customers in two of the customers come running out and they apprehended him they uh, so the public actually helped the police to, they, they to catch did. him they yeah. did yeah. Um, and from that point that's when they discovered they'd actually caught the Black Panther Donald Nielsen so I take it then he was tried and yeah, convicted and he was tried, he was five life sentences. Um he died in two thousand eleven in, in um Norwich prison. Yeah. Um he, got, he eventually got motor neuro motor neuron disease when he died. Um but yeah, very, very sad story and a story that certainly hit the locals here um, really, really hard at the time. Yeah, very, very tragic from what you've been explaining, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Very tragic, very tragic story. The question is, could it have been avoided? We'll never we know. We don't know.